tonight, and I do want to give him as much time as possible to share with you his kind of lessons. Dr. Julius Fabus, and I, I'm not sure that uh, I've ever heard him referred to as Dr. Fabus before, although I'm sure it's a, a title that he is well proud of. Julius and I have been friends for a long while. He's affiliated at present time with the University of Massachusetts and has been for a good many years. And we ran into each other in places other than Massachusetts that uh, while he was teaching in Australia and I was heading a department in Australia, we shared uh, opportunities to exchange notes over there. Julius was born in Marcali, Hungary. And I hear stories uh, through our uh, inner circle in landscape architecture, uh, through the, the grapevine, the network, that suggests that in fact he was uh, barely a couple of steps ahead of the Russian tanks at the time of the Hungarian Revolution back in the 50s. He might correct some of those stories for me uh, if I've been misinformed. He's a proud father of three children. He carries with him a diploma in agronomy from Hungary, a Bachelor of Science in Plant Science from Rutgers University, a Master of Landscape Architecture from Harvard University, and a PhD in Resource Planning and Conservation from the University of Michigan. His credits include graduation at one point or another, summa cum laude. He carries numerous scholarships and fellowships, he has received the Bradford Williams Award in Landscape Architecture for best printed article of a particular year in our profession, 1971. He has been a recipient of the Caldwell Award and a recipient this past year of an award for outstanding educator uh, presented by the Council of Education, uh, Council of Educators in Landscape Architecture. He has been the recipient of 16 major research grants over the years. He has long been a teacher at my own alma mater, the University of Massachusetts, practices and has practiced extensively in the profession itself has been the author of more than 50 books and articles. Julius, when I first met him, impressed upon me the fact that uh, you don't need to be pretentious. You don't need to wave your own flag to in fact be a leader in this field. And he has done just that. As he's gone out and so proudly uh, achieved the grants that he well deserved to carry on research work. He made sure that those grants did not stop with the research itself, but included the kinds of uh, backing that allowed him distribute, to distribute the uh, results of his work throughout the profession. The, uh, those of us in the profession of landscape architecture have many times been the recipient of major reports produced by Julius Fabos and his colleagues uh, at Massachusetts and in uh, Australia. He's uh, been very effective in getting the word out. He has been in the forefront of this profession, has indeed led us, as we find ourselves today, in a world of computer applications in landscape planning. It's because of Julius Fabos. I'm proud tonight to give you an opportunity to share with me the words of Julius Fabus. Thank you, Charlie. Now I think even better now. I use a lot of visual aid tonight because uh, I have a handicap. Uh, not only this room, but also my funny accent. Although I uh, was born in the Midwest, uh, Midwest Europe, and I picked up my English in New Jersey. I really did. Honestly, I studied there at Rutgers for four years, and 
uh, Jeff Hall knows it, uh, and I'm very proud to have here a number of people from our department, Toro Tava, and of course our, your, uh, your great department at Chuck, and Jeff Hall, who are three of them, went to somehow UMass, which is the second oldest landscape architecture program in the world. And it's just one, one year after Harvard. I will come back to that. But what, what I would like to talk to you about is landscape planning. Light is done good. Uh, this title suggests two things which I would like to share with you. And I think both of these titles you need very badly in this school. Uh, when I walked around today, I found that you are primary design program, both in architecture and in landscape architecture. And I would like to emphasize the other two aspects, the planning aspects, whether you are an architect or landscape architect. And I would like to uh, emphasize the computer aspect because this is the technology which is changing you and my life very fast. And if you did not awake to that yet, then uh, you have to have to do it very fast. In fact, when I was working with Toro Otava in your computer room, you have beautiful facilities. You have uh, six, eight apples, and I didn't see one single person in the computer room. And we have a much smarter program than you have. We have the same number of terminals is, is, is always filled up. So I think something is going on uh, at UMass which is not going on here. And I don't know who is right, but I believe that uh, you have to learn about the computer technology extremely fast. What I want to talk about tonight, today, tonight, is basically uh, this. First, I would like to run down, give a historical context, arguing that indeed uh, planning was always part of landscape architecture. When we talk about the traditional landscape architecture, side design, uh, anybody who does not know the history may say that, but anybody who knows the history knows that indeed planning was always a very in uh, important part of landscape architecture and architecture and other fields. Then I would like to give you some definitions, because I use certain terms which you may not be familiar or you may have a different meaning behind those terms. Uh, then I would like to provide a theme which I want, want to argue for, I want to argue that why planning as part of landscape architecture, I want to argue definitely why I uh, use the computer. And then I would like to go on and describe to you briefly the present capabilities. And I talk about uh, how, how the electronic age not only changed the banking, as we know. Today you don't uh, exchange money too much uh, by taking your money out and giving it to somebody. But we know that much of the money flow in this country is going electronically, so will be much of the map making and drawings and simulations of architecture drawings and landscape architecture will be there. And for to understand what's going on, I would like to share with you some of my uh, knowledge and information on, on data input output devices. Then I would like to talk about how to manipulate the data, how to produce alternative plans with the, data, with, with, with the various information. And obviously I use the Metland the research project which I have been involved now for about 14 years. I should not use Harvard procedure because why should I? I am from UMass and, uh, and that's what I will talk about. Then I will talk about a bit uh, about future prospects. The future prospect again I will cover what is in, in, in the technology which changes the way how we draw, we simulate uh, our, our design and our ideas. And finally I, I try to uh, talk about the, the last uh, the, the, what is the front, uh, the, what's forthcoming in, in data manipulation, a new frontier of data manipulation technology. As you see, I want to cover a lot, and I was told that I can talk about three, four hours, because you have some architects who shows their design and drawings and buildings for hours, so why can't I spend the same time here? No, I will not spend that much. If I see that there's an interest in your eyes, then probably I will hang on longer. If not, I just move too very fast. And if you want to know what's, what's going on, you can read all these things because we have, we have published a lot, and, and you can find the same things what I tell you in publications. On the historical context, I would like to uh, just show you a few slides on the landscape where I, where I come from. And I think this is an introduction for people who are interested in both architectural environment and landscape. And I would like to just run through a few slides to show you uh, a very different landscape from the Midwest. And although I, I am very much fond of uh, beautiful farmlands, cornfields, and the like, I, I, I am, because I, I was a farmer boy, and I grew up on, uh, on cornfields, and I love it. 
is, is really beautiful. Uh, I learned to uh, love about landscape because of cornfields and apple orchards and, and vineyards and the like. There's another landscape in the East Coast where I happen to live now and I, I also love it. Equally lovely landscape, looking down from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Mount Holyoke Range, later on, I'll be showing this landscape simulated by computers and photographed 525 miles from the, uh, from the uh, spacecraft of the Earth satellite. And this is a cultural landscape that we have, this beautiful cultural landscape, the tobacco field, uh, down in the valley. And this is the most uh, uh, fertile agricultural land in, in Massachusetts, this, uh, this beautiful valley on the Connecticut River. And the colors, of course, are gorgeous. The Mount Holyoke Range, again, you can see up there, is, is, a, is a lovely, lovely landscape uh, to be in. Then I, I'll show you a few slides of the cultural landscape, the, uh, the town hall in, in the Amherst Town Hall. Uh, McKean, the famous architect, designed this building uh, at the turn of the century. And just to uh, give you a few other images, uh, some of the houses, uh, the very romantic landscape, all of the big, beautiful big trees. And the color, of course, uh, with a lot of maple trees. Uh, that makes the color. That makes this beautiful red oranges, as you can see, these this golden colors. Uh, this uh, cemetery on the right, uh, that's not yet, but one of the cemeteries was designed by Holmes, that we show some slides of that in a moment. That's, uh, that slide's coming from the uh, cemetery, which was done by Holmes. Holmes, of course, is the, is the uh, most famous uh, landscape architect uh, of the 19th century, and I have a few words about him. Uh, let's continue, in fact, I, I, I continue with Olmsted, because many people think that uh, landscape planning, the way as we practice it, is, is, is started with a computer. It is not. In fact, the first landscape architect, Olmsted, and his student, Charles Elliott, did a magnificent work in, uh, in the Boston area. And they were responsible uh, uh, for, the, for the first major park system, and I'll just uh, show you a few slides on that. Uh, this is Olmsted, and uh, this is his park system. Some 10 miles park connecting downtown Boston with the Cape, uh, with the, with the uh, Common, to Common Garden Avenue, to the Muddy River. And the first major park system was started as the regional plan, the first regional plan, when the, when the engineers thought as a problem to correct, to correct the Muddy River, uh, the sewage problem with the Muddy River to, uh, to, uh, to eliminate by engineering technology, at the same time, always there's a tremendous opportunity by determining opportunities, recreational opportunities in that, in, that, uh, in that area. Indeed, if you see, he went through, I hope I pushed the right button, no I didn't. Uh, the, the whole park system was replanned, redesigned, and uh, we can see the construction work which had to be done to create this, uh, this uh, park system. And by about 19, uh, 1890 or so, you had a beautiful uh, waterway for recreation. Uh, and then come uh, down from the common belt avenue, you can go down uh, to, uh, uh, to the common belt avenue into the park system. And that was the first major parkway which owns the design, the uh, uh, first major parkway we know in history, very significant historical element, part of landscape planning. And again, uh, some uh, current slides of that. And uh, some other recreation border areas, the, the famous Jamaica Pond, and of course the engineers tinkering with, uh, with the system. As you can see, the uh, parkland is always free, and everybody has other ideas about parklands in, in urban areas. The next major giant, whose player I think is, uh, you should know something about, is Charles Elliott. Charles Elliott is the person who was his uh, was almost a student and responsible for the first major Boston metropolitan park system, the first major in the, in the United States, which affected 250 square miles of, 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 the, of, of the Boston metropolitan area. In fact, what, Holmes, what Elliott has done, what Elliott has done is creating this enormous park system. That was, the, that was Olmsted 10 miles uh, park system, and, and Charles Elliott protected all the major stories, as you can see, 
He set aside major wild wilderness areas, six of them around the city. The, the beaches has been reclaimed. That was the first major reclamation project ever in the history of the, of the world, as far as I know. To, to take back from, from, uh, from individual's use the, uh, the famous Reveal Beach and turn it into public use. And, and indeed, he established the landscape planning at the next level, next plateau. Some more details that the Charles River, Estuary, which, which is a park system, where our students at Harvard, uh, there was a big fight. The engineers wanted to put a four lane superhighway uh, here, and we were able to stop them. They wanted to trade up these uh, uh, beautiful trees and beautiful uh, parkland you will see just now. That touches the Milan Highway because their objective was very simple. More people want to go to the city, so why not we build uh, more, more highways? And we were able to stop it. And that's how the wilderness is what he has done. Now, the next major work, as you can see, landscape planning really in the Boston area as part of landscape architecture was obvious falling. The third major project, uh, which is still under implementation, uh, was the, uh, the uh, Benton Mackay study. But before I go there, I want to just uh, give you a little uh, a story about the, uh, the foundation of planning, where planning came from. In Europe, it came from surveying very often. It came from engineering. It came from architecture. It came from all sorts of fields. But interestingly, in the United States, the first planning course ever given at any institution was at Harvard in 1916 and by, given by the Landscape Architecture Department. The first planning program ever in the United States, as far as I know, was given as a program within the landscape architecture in 1928. So what is the tradition of landscape architecture? Is it site design? Is it site planning? It is, yes. Because Olmsted was involved with site design, so was Elliot. But it's also planning. And I will come to the, what I mean, uh, uh, why I want to emphasize planning for those people who are primarily interested in the design, which is how to do that when, when the planning has been decided. Okay? So I am advocating here a broader look. Whether you are an architect or landscape architect, I am advocating much broader look to be involved more in planning. The third major uh, evolution of the planning within the Boston metropolitan area, in that evolution, what I try to explain to you, is the famous Mackay Elliott plan uh, from 1928 on and is still being implemented. And uh, I think I have a few slides on that. This is the famous Charles Elliott, the second, the nephew of the very famous. Charles Elliott, and this is the cutest landscape architect ever. You were, uh, I think he was here, uh, Phil Lewis. He's the cutest, really uh, awful cute person, about four foot two inches. Lovely guy, he was my professor, he's very capable, and a giant towering landscape architect who got the uh, medal, the highest award that the landscape architect gave anybody. I think he got last year the landscape architecture award. And indeed, the landscape architecture profession respects the planning aspects of the profession very much indeed. And the work, what they have done, is to develop an open space system for the whole state of Massachusetts. Uh, the Charles Elliott plan, the 250 square mile, was this. And then the, uh, the uh, other major uh, park system here. And all the major critical areas of the state of Massachusetts has been identified as, as so important that it has to be turned into some sort of public use, some public preservation, some public protection. Indeed, this part of the uh, system is being purchased now. And Amherst is in that area. I showed you some photographs. Amherst is here. And I showed you some photographs uh, from this region. And that's the Connecticut River here, which, uh, which has this beautiful farm landscape, which we saw from the air with the tobacco, uh, tobacco nettings and the like. Okay? And I will show the next project, which I was, I was involved, is a 4,000 square mile of landscape coming down to Providence, Rhode Island. That's the Southeastern New England Regional Study. That, that's the fourth phase of, of a more, com a more contemporary landscape planning. Okay, and that's the, uh, the base circuit plan, the more detailed plan, and you can see how the highways try to use the same land which the uh, park people wanted to uh, use for open space and parks. In fact, Charles Elliott, the same person, stopped the Middlebelt Highway which was proposed during the early, late 1960s and early 1970s, almost single-handedly. He was able to convince the legislators that that highway is not needed because the landscape 
is too fragile and cannot support that type of pressure what the engineers wanted to uh, place on them by, by planning the superhighways. The fourth phase of the evolution, I think I finished with the slides. The fourth phase of the evolution of this landscape planning historically over the past 100 years is the CINI study, the Southeastern New England Regional Study. And I just introduced these ideas. I don't want to explain to you in, in great detail. But indeed, I was involved in developing what we call the holding capacity model or a procedure by which we determine how much development the landscape can take uh, because of the nature and characteristics of the landscape. And we did design a three-phase study, which we call an eliminative or, or, or exclusionary procedure. That's, that's the lingo you, you talk in, in, in landscape planning. The first phase of the study was what we called at that time and today uh, uh, to determine the critical resources for preservation. We were interested to determine uh, what type of uh, wetland, water bodies, uh, and other, other resources warrants preservation of that landscape. In other words, keep it as is, don't use it. The next stage was in the study what we call phase two of determining landscape which are important but can take certain degree of agriculture use, recreation use, uh, uh, scenic easements, and the like. And the leftover land we cut, that can be developed. And based on the suitability, we determined five levels from low to high density uses. So that's, a, that's another type of landscape planning study. The type of planning which has been articulated and, and, and emphasized very much by McHarg are this quite different approach than the McHargian study. However, it comes with the same type of conclusions that indeed, in the black area, we try to develop meant no, no, because a society has greater value for those resources, and therefore we don't want to give it up for, for, uh, for unwarranted uses because that's our water supply, that's our sand and gravel supply, that's, that's all the critical wildlife, wetlands, and whatnot you have. Then we have the area which, is, uh, which, uh, which uh, may be used, but not, to, uh, not extensively, the water has developed, and then the, this, this larger edge we can develop to uh, various degrees depend upon the capability of the, of the land. So this is the history, basically. This is uh, this ecological, environmental ethic, which was the foundation of landscape architecture ever since it started uh, during, the, uh, during the Olmsted era in the, in the mid-19th century. Now, uh, I would like to give you some definitions in the same line and show you what I mean under the various terms and that again leads you into the type of approach what we, what we use and why we use it. First, I want to uh, define what do, what do we mean under landscape? At least, what do I mean landscape? For many people, landscape is just a scenery what you see on the ground. For us, who are involved in environmental planning and land use planning, as landscape architects, as landscape planners, it means more than that. It means, uh, it means um, a subset of environment. I can talk about agriculture landscape, which not only talks about what, what I see on the surface, but what is the soil productivity, what is the groundwater potential, what is the air quality, and then the like. Okay, that's, that's how we define landscape. What is planning? Planning is an activity. It's not a profession like, uh, like architecture, landscape art. You don't have to have a specific training for that. Because all of us are planners, really. In fact, every, every, uh, every, every architect, as I mentioned, every landscape architects are also planners. Every engineer is a planner. Well, they touch this to what degree? We talk about degrees. Of course, there are professional planners who are trained to, uh, to use a system approach or uh, use a, a conceptual approach, whatever they may be, uh, to, to, to solve certain uh, planning problems. Uh, so, are the, uh, so, uh, so are the architects. When there are architects planners, we call them urban designers. When there are uh, planners in the landscape architecture, we call them landscape planners. When there are uh, in a planner for engineers, they, they may be water resource planners, they may be transportation planners, they can be all sorts of things. So basically, everybody's a planner. A few other keywords which I would like to share with you. What's analysis? I use this word analysis because very often we talk about regional analysis, uh, site analysis, meaning what? We mean something to break down into parts. I analyze the slope, the 10%, 15%, uh, 5%, so we break them down. But we also use them uh, very often when we put uh, values on the land, or values on certain aspects of the, of the resource, and when we, when we do assessment. When we mean variation, we put values on various parts. And finally, the term is very important, assessment. 
assessment is we use the same way as bankers use or, or, or town assessors use to assess your house. What they do, they analyze your house, the certain parts of that, they put values on them, they put values on the size of the house, the age of the house, uh, the, the distance from the school, the location, the densities, or what not you have, and then you end up, you assess the house value, that house in town of Muncie, Indiana, worth 50 or 60 or 80 thousand dollars. If you put the same house into a different setting, a different town, it may work less or may, may work more. That's assessment. And the same way we use in landscape, landscape architecture, landscape planning, assessment. It's a very important concept. And then another concept which I have to introduce to you, evaluation. What does it mean, evaluation? In the planning literature, evaluation means Evaluation we use only when we have alternatives, when we propose various alternative uh, scenarios, alternative uh, plans, and then how do we decide, decide which of the alternative plan is better than the other against the set of criteria. That's how we use evaluation. Now finally, I would like to define you another critical term, and that's, that's what I call landscape planning. And here I would like to underline something especially for you people. What is the difference between design and planning? The planning tries to answer three questions. What to do, where to do it, and why to do it. These are the most important questions in any decision making. The fourth question is how to do it. And if you are just involved in the how, what kind of shape to put on, you know? What kind of style, how, how, how to build the house, the structure. Those are, those are the secondary decisions. In a way, what I'm advocating that every profession and architecture, landscape architecture should try to influence the society about these very crucial questions, what, where, why, before we go into how to do it. If you want to have an influence, that's one way to do. And we do it obviously, a landscape planner does it for land use decisions. And here I want to say a few words about the role of the landscape planner, the landscape architect. I believe that our role is not only to, show, to tell the client how to do this, if you, if you decide that I want housing development, and I put the houses here, I put the, uh, put the road here, and, and that, that's how I do the work, and that's our design. That's our design, our detailed work. We also have to tell them, indeed, uh, our role is that we, we, we bring three things, uh, two things together, basically. One is we are responsible to, 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 uh, to interpret the science for, for decision making. Now what do I mean? A soil scientist, an ecologist, a hydrologist, are these people brought scientific knowledge either to measure floodplain, measure soil productivity, measure so soil suitability and the like. But to, to make, to influence that, uh, use, using that science to influence decision, we have to do something with it, we have to interpret it. And I believe the landscape planner's role is to interpret the scientific information that we can make better decision. The last decade alone, the scientific knowledge of the earth doubled. In one decade, the next five years, we expect that the scientific knowledge will double again. Much of the scientific information has tremendous relevance to landscape architecture, landscape planning, or environmental design, or land use decisions, whatever you want to call it. Somebody has to do it. When I went to school at Harvard, I didn't know what a soil scientist is doing. They have a faintest idea from the point of landscape architecture. Now, now no landscape architect could survive without that knowledge. Now it's essential. In, 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 in Harvard, when I was a student, there was no question asked when we designed a new town on, on the Florida wetlands. No, no question was asked. On the coastal wetlands, we built a new town by digging. Nobody asked a question. Today, there is an ethic, and every landscape artist ought to understand the value of coastal wetlands. It's a new bargain. The past 20 years, because an environmentalist, a total new awareness, and a whole set of new things has happened. Finally, we also have to deal with the values. We have to understand the economic values. We have to understand the, the political structure and the values of the, uh, of the decision makers. We have to deal with ethical issues, the aesthetic values, the professional values and the like. What I'm saying here, that indeed, planning, environmental planning, landscape planning, uh, architecture planning, or whatever you call, is getting more complex. And indeed, that's one of the reasons why we are moving towards, one of the reasons we are moving towards the computers. And indeed, that's how we do it. That's the, that's the way that we are dealing with increasingly more knowledge, increasingly more factors, incre increasingly more messy situation. Indeed, that's the reason why, why we, we don't have a choice but to work with the, with the machine. 
My theme for the rest of the presentation is indeed that computer assisted landscape planning can improve the decision making and, include, and, and, and can improve public participation. That's the major thing I would like to. And I think at the end of the presentation, I'll be, I'll be able to prove. You know, if, if you can follow me, I think I'm able to prove to you that it can do both. And it also can expand, in my judgment, the boundaries of any professional use of the machine, use as computers. Why? Very simple. Information, any information, especially more and better information you can have, uh, provide anyone with greater influence. That you ought to know. And if you fail to understand that, then you fail to understand uh, your, your profession. Now I would like to go on and describe what is the present capabilities in regard to computers and landscape planning. First, a few words about the impact of the computers. The impact of the computers can be compared with any technology. You can compare with the railroad, you can compare with the auto technology, the airplane technology, it uh, doesn't make any, any, uh, any difference what you, what you compare. And indeed, when I compare this technology, or just analyze this technology, the same curve will apply to computers as, as, as applied to anything else. The expected, uh, expected impact of computers on landscape planning or architecture or name it. Doesn't make any difference. We started about 20 years ago very slowly. We barely did anything. In 1980, we are just taking off. 1982, 83, we are just taking off. The progress from here will be extremely uh, rapid. Now, I, if, if this is true, I ask any architect student here, I ask every land, any, any landscape architect student, how much computer knowledge you have when you go out? If you have none, as soon as you move that from this building, you are outdated. I guarantee to you. If you have a low, then you are somewhat outdated, or, or more outdated, but not as much as the person doesn't have any. Indeed, it changes everybody's life. And I want to prove it, indeed, by the end of this presentation. What is happening in computers? They have tremendous advancement, especially in the year of landscape planning, in what we call data input, data output technology. Uh, data input means how they acquire data for the computers. In other words, up to this point, when you, when you uh, try to get a map, a land use map, a land cover map, a transportation map, or whatever, you have to get a map, an actual paper map, and the things are drawn on it. How it will be 10 years from now? It will come to you electronically, and that's the revolution. How is the output? Today, you magic marker. Okay, I saw that people were selecting magic markers. You know, uh, four or five colors of magic marker to, to do analysis, and then for hour after hour you, uh, you draw and make your map. Or you are sketching, you use uh, whatever color, whatever technique you use. Doesn't make too much difference. That's your output device. What is in the future? With, with computer, uh, computer output. More and more like a color output. Indeed, we are moving from maps to, uh, to digital electronic data. And the advancement on that is, is absolutely incredible. I cannot give you too much uh, on this topic because that would be hours of, hours of discussion. I just hit, hit your highlight, a few highlight, highlight on that. Um, first, on remote sensing uh, uh, data and, and data manipulation. You probably heard about the Earth satellite, the Landsat 1, the Landsat 2, the Landsat 3. That was the first major uh, public effort when we as a society I think I would like to have the, yeah. When we as a society began to get information, digital information, 520 miles over the surface, and that is a beautiful landscape which I showed you. Now that's not a true picture, and that's very crude, because all the pixel elements which this whole photograph made up is one acre, a bit bigger than one acre. Now a few years after, in fact, just last year, another technology, the Landsat 4 technology, was, uh, was launched. And we have now true color, the same landscape. And this landscape with a machine is reproduced, just like if you would be the helicopter. We are able to helicopter the landscape with electronic media. 
We don't have to uh, rent a helicopter for $300 an hour. We can go up into the electric machine and we can zoom into the, in zoom, zoom into the landscape. The next is a zoom in. You know, that's a zoom in. That's a smoke pack there. 525 miles down, you can see this type of detail. Absolutely incredible. And the next technology which will be launched by the French in 1965, actually 1985, this has a 30 by 30, uh, 30 meter pixel. The next technology will be 10 meter by 10 meter pixel. Or one tenth of the area size will be, which means that we can do side design almost from the information that we are able to get from, uh, from, uh, from remote sensing satellite. Incredible technology. Let's talk about the next type of uh, data output input devices. Demographic data is used already, and computer graphics is used extensively, uh, extensively for, for demographic data. And the examples that I want to show you just two among the many. One is the United States government making decisions on demographic data. That's, uh, I'm sorry for that the production is coming from a newsletter which does not have the, the, the good for the color. And another New England wide business decisions are made using geographic data. And this other type of map making technology, the, the data output technology, which is now our electronic, our automated. And finally, on this line, a few more words on this, uh, this issue. There are other outputs, obviously. You can buy now that, uh, that computer which, uh, which I just uh, photographed there. This type of color output you, uh, today you are able to buy for $4,000, roughly. And, and this is a computer uh, mapping for publication, which just shows the, the range of time and, and the type of uh, uh, mapping which you can do with, uh, with, uh, with computer. Indeed, the computer input and output technology has advanced to a tremendous degree. Where we are not as much advanced is the data manipulation. And I would like to here to run through basically, very rapidly, with some of the research that we have done in, in closing the gap, what we call in the area of data manipulation. In other words, what I'm saying now, there's a tremendous amount of electronic data is coming to us. And just like today, the great majority of the money is, 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 is handled from bank to bank, from one country to other electronically, we will handle the same way the spatial data, which, which is essential for landscape architecture, landscape planning, environmental planning, or, or, uh, or, or architecture. Now, the data manipulation is where we have the greatest difficulty. We are probably 10, 15 years behind the time. And I would, like to, I would like to tell you where we are now and what it does for us. The uh, Motland research has done an overall procedural model, what we call, which has three phases. I come back to that again once, once more to that. It has what we call an assessment phase, which, which determines what to do, where to do, how much, how good, how it is distributed, how it is valued. That's an ongoing process for everything that we have in the environment. If you have a community, it has water supply, it has sand and gravel, it has good agricultural land, it has suitability areas for development, it has, it has uh, cultural areas, uh, resources and the like, that should be all assessed and it should be an ongoing process. And because the electronic age, we believe, first time in the history of, of, the, uh, of our towns, our communities, we will be able to do that. Okay. The second is, we have all this demand on that resources. There are various human objectives, and those human objectives can be achieved in many different ways. There's not, not, not only one way, two ways, three ways, ten ways, hundred, there are million ways we can achieve our objectives. The third phase is we can evaluate them against a set of criteria. In this case, of course, I'm advocating environmental landscape criteria. I would like to give you some examples on assessment. We can, for instance, assess, uh, we can assess uh, the physical development suitability, topo climatic suitability, we can have combined values, and I'll give you a few slides on, on, on these examples. I'm sorry, this is a, a super graphic which I forget to show you. This is basically done by the computers with photographic quality. 
which I wanted to underline that the data output technology is as good as, as, as color photographic quality if you want. And that technology is available. And you know, if it's available to produce a, a beautiful woman like that, it's available to produce a beautiful rendering for, uh, for architects and a beautiful site plan for landscape architects. It's a matter of time how fast it will be taken over uh, or, or, or uh, adapted by us. On top of assi on, on, on assessment, we can generate physical development suitability. In this particular case, uh, the machine describes, I'm sorry, I have to use this one. The machine describes the red areas which are the best, highest quality uh, uh, resources uh, from the physical development point of view, which is based on five or six different type of uh, factors, such as the groundwater, uh, not the groundwater, the uh, drainage characteristics, the depth to bedrock, and, and other, other uh, important characteristics what we, we build into the computer. The topoclimatic characteristics which measure the, the solar receipt, it measures the, the wind, the other topoclimatic characteristics, and again says that the red areas are the best topoclimatic uh, zones within that, within that community. You also can, also can uh, develop a profile, uh, a resource profile if you wish, which tells you that in terms of special resources, in every one of these three communities, that percent is the best quality, uh, that percent is the, uh, the second best quality, in hazard potentials, we can again uh, uh, talk about um, uh, flood hazard issues, noise, uh, uh, air pollution issues, in development suitability. So you can create a profile by the machine, and you are able to map them out by the machine, and that shows where those various uh, tones may be on the map, and which are the, the potential uh, use potential after the all of the landscape. So this is assessment. That should be an ongoing process in our judgment. The next, the next phase is the plan formulation. Indeed, plans we can generate from many points of view, and in this particular case, I show you at least three different approaches that we used. Approach one, just to give you some, some ideas about the structure of this type of modeling, one of the approach is what we call A goal-oriented approach. What do we mean on the goal-oriented approach? If I assessed agricultural land, if I assessed, for instance, uh, uh, development suitability areas, then I can set a goal that we are protecting our the best agricultural land, and we can set another goal that we are using uh, only the, the areas for development which is the best suited for development. That's a goal-oriented approach. It does not have any economic implication, or just, if nothing else, something very general. Other type of approach may be a cost-benefit approach, where our objective may be how I can develop our landscape in such a way that I, I lose the least amount uh, of those resources which has some public value. So it, it, this is called by economy, economy, economy the, the benefit-loss uh, approach. Then we can combine the two approaches. How can I achieve? the cost benefit as well as how I can achieve the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, my goals. That's the combined. And of course we can go with the, with the existing urban area uh, conventional approach as well. So what we have done in our, in, our, in our procedures, we developed a number of procedures because we believe that planning is a learning process and by able to articulate the pros and cons of the various alternative ways to think about your resources, about your environment, you know, we hopefully can direct the, the communities to, uh, to, to a better direction. Now to uh, illustrate this further, the goal-oriented approach I can illustrate to you by a, by a very simple map. In this particular case, what we wanted to do is to achieve two goals that we are preserving our agricultural land and we are putting our housing on the, on the most suitable areas. Now if we are using the computers to apply this, this particular two objectives, we are getting a spatial map. And the spatial map shows us that in the town of Greenfield, which is about 15,000 acres, we have about 1,600 acres of the landscape which meets that criteria. This criteria is that class A physical development suitability is 
the, the best, and, and we are not building anything on the inequality agricultural land. So by, by setting this type of goals, indeed, we find out if this is our goal to achieve, where are the landscape where we can develop our, our, uh, our uh, developments while preserving our agricultural land. Let's go to the next level. We talk about the benefit uh, loss uh, analysis. We can ask the computers, please computer give us the first 100 acres, the first 500, the first 600, 1,000, 1,500 acres, whatever it may be. We I, as a community, would have the least amount of resource loss by not building on agricultural land, by not building on flat plain, by, by avoiding all the hazardous areas of, of any kind where we identify a model, and we have over 32 different type of uh, assessment that we, can, that we can record by a machine. And the, 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 the machine simply rank over there. Uh, all the cells, every third of an acre cell, rank over there in the community and determine which are the cells where the development cost would be the, the, uh, the least. In this case, the, the computer was searching and all those areas where you have this, this uh, hedge line, all those areas were found, uh, all these areas were found which meets that criteria. It simply says, that if, if your objective is cost-benefit only, we can, we, can, we can help you, but it does not mean that you're achieving some of the other goals which the other approach would do. The third, of course, is a combination of the two. It's very simple. You combine the two. And here the objective is that we have the first 1,500 acres. At the same time, we would like to preserve all the classic agriculture land and we want to only develop on the best suitable, most suitable land within that 1,500 acres. What the computer found was, and I think I have a slide for you. I'm sorry. I think I broke something. Not yet. Sound. Shame on me. Am I all right? Thank you. Thank you. The, the, major, the major learning from this map is that we wanted the 1,500 acres while achieving two other goals. We could not have it. The computer found only 1,245 acres, those red areas. So what it basically says that, that uh, if we want to develop 1,500 acres, the only way we can do, either we build on best agricultural land, which we didn't want to, which we didn't want to uh, give up, or we have to build on certain lands which are not the best suited, suited for development. Okay, so this is the, the basic learning from that. Uh, finally, We can deal also with, an, with a third area of, of plan evaluation. And as I mentioned to you earlier, plan evaluation for us means we like, we would like to determine what is the effects of the alternatives on our resources or our environment. And, and one example which I would like to show you is probably the most exciting example I've ever found in our research. It was very simple that that when we, com when we took two alternatives, one is the, what we call the landscape sensitive alternative. We took another one, which is, uh, which is uh, based on the present trend growth, we have a present growth trend. So in other words, we accept the present policies of, of the growth policies without, without, without any, any changes in the policy. We found that in the result, 71% between the two extreme plans, we had agreement. 71% of the area, we had agreement. I can show you this on the, on the photographs. Hopefully that this time I don't knock over something. I am very clumsy today, I'm sorry. And this is the description. It simply shows that 26% that is the area where we have conflict. However, 71% of the area, we have a total agreement between the most Two extreme alternatives. Very important. Remember of that. 
we are looking in the map for this stone. This is the area of plan one, the, uh, the landscape sensitive plan and the plan two, the status quo plan, do agree. And then special, the computer prints out us that those are the areas where the value of the agreement. We, we printed over on, a, on an air photo that you can see what's under it. So that was one of our, uh, one of our objectives. And for publication it works, but it doesn't work that well for, for slides. I'm sorry for that. In summary, what we learned from this is that indeed, computer aided landscape planning is aiding in the learning process. That's a very important thing to understand. Planning is a learning process. The landscape planner, the urban designer, uh, the other planner are really the coordinators of that learning process. We have feedback from the public, we have, we have information from the science, we are manipulating that information, and our objective is to minimize the, the conflicts and, and to, to maximize opportunities. That's our objective, that's the reason why we are doing planning. We want to influence a better decision, a more intelligent decision. That's our objective. And indeed, I believe, that if we have such a planning as I showed to you, when there are two conflicting groups, one who is uh, pro-developers, others, others are opposite side, we don't want to develop anything, we can show to them that on 71% of the total area, we have agreement. You see what I mean? What does it mean? That, that we have the same type of uh, role as the mediators who try to mediate, uh, let's say, conflict between the workers and the management. That's a conflict resolution. And here the landscape panic has a new role, by, by aided by the machine in conflict res resolution, which I, which I suggest here indeed that we can make the planning much more democratic. And that's through the machine. Now, a few words finally about the future. Where are we going from here? What we see in the future? What we see in the future? I break down the future in the three categories, as I explained to you, the, uh, the computer-aided landscape planning earlier. And the first, where we, where we have further development, obviously, in data input. What we will have in the future? I suggest to you that within the next decade or so, or in some cases sooner, most of the spatial information what we will use will be automated and put into computers. We have major federal commitments, state commitments and the like, which will be able to do that. And indeed, indeed we have some of the technology uh, which is the most uh, promising is the uh, combination of the video and microcomputer technology. Measurex Corporation here in, uh, I think in Idaho, not, not I, uh, I, I think uh, Idaho, where, where they are located, they combine very successfully the video technology with microcomputers, and for about $30,000 today, you are able to buy a, a video machine, you have, you have a map, any type of map, land use, land cover, soils, map, uh, topographic maps you, you may have, you photograph by the video and automatically you put that uh, to that lines into the computer and you can manipulate the data from there on. Incredible technology. Absolutely incredible. And this is not being affordable for the average landscape architect, for the average, uh, average office. Indeed, what I foresee and what everybody writes about, that, uh, that the future landscape architect, landscape planner, we will be able to work at home at the terminal, not at the drafting table, but at the terminal. And we will be part of a network. Today, when I want to use uh, soils information, land use land cover information, I have to run around, buy my maps, every, every map is different scale, different accuracy. This type of work will be done by my machine. My machine will come up other machines and will, will ask where are the, the, uh, the appropriate maps which I need. And, and they will bring everything together, scale, accuracy, what I need. That, that's that's what, what, what works for us in the future. How about data output? I argue that while the 1920s were the year of water sketches, then in the 1960s on, we moved to magic marker, whatever technology used. And each of these simulations are very unrealistic. Each of them are false. I've seen architecture drawings of ugly, uh, uh, ugly uh, 
uh, public housing uh, rendered beautifully. Uh, somebody was lying because was able to render, make a beautiful rendering, and, and cover that with trees, not with buildings. And people were jumping all around. It looked like a very nice, happy, happy situation. When the, when the structure was built, it became an ugly environment. Very bad environment indeed. Indeed, we have done simulations a lot by drawings, which, by, which has been incorrect. Not only we can lie with statistics, we can lie with drawings. What is, I think, the future for us is that the machine, the technology, combination of video technology, computer technology, forces us to simulate our design much more accurately than anything we have, we have been able to do up to this point. So the whole idea, the traditional architect who is working at the, uh, at the, uh, at the drafting table, the way as we are teaching you today, and the way as we are teaching landscape architects is for today and for yesterday. For tomorrow, something else is coming. And I want to underline it, you ought to learn the machine because, because whenever a new technology is coming in, there are three types of people. It talks about the, the first wave people who wants to go backwards, the most of us, the starter who wants to maintain the status quo, and a few people who see the technology coming. And I believe that your, your, your administrators, your professors, see that this technology is coming. That's why they bought the machines for you. But very, very few people use it, uses them. Until you have this change, obviously, most of you will belong to the second wave of Tuffler's uh, 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 classification. Finally, and other exciting things I would like to mention to you, what is coming for data manipulation? What is the new frontiers in data manipulation? I believe that we are moving towards the expert systems, which is very often uh, uh, described by computer uh, scientists as artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence basically has three faces. One is what three types of artificial intelligence we, we most of us read about or talk about today. One is the artificial intelligence which makes the robots work. That technology has been developed superbly. We have now, I don't know, Japanese has some 60,000 uh, robots, America has some 15,000 robots, and, and we believe that perhaps 10, 15 years, most of the traditional technology, this routine work that will be done by the robots. Now, what is the next type of artificial intelligence here? Next type of artificial intelligence is the type which is affecting you and me more than anything else. And that's what's called, that's what's called the expert systems. What is the expert system? Expert system has been developed to date in three fields. And I think by, by example, I, I can tell you more what the expert system is. The expert system to be used in chemistry, in geology, and in medical science the most. There are today expert models which can diagnose up to 500 illness. And those expert systems are better, they, 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 can, they can diagnose you better than the average doctor. How they work, what they do, they are able to program into the computer how the best diagnostic person of the medical science would go about to find that, uh, find that uh, illness. And by programming not only one, but number of experts into the machine, they are able to diagnose, indeed, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the illness as better than any, any one of the human beings can do, or the every human being can, uh, can, can, can do it today. Indeed, that's a new frontier in environmental landscape planning. And interesting enough that current leaders are not the Americans, because the American Artificial Intelligence Group uh, developed a very, very difficult uh, program called the LISP. Probably some of you read about the LISP. And those people are called the LISPers, who are, who are doing the... Into landscape environmental planning are the Portuguese. In fact, only two weeks ago, I got the first paper from Portuguese, which is about a, a 15 Xerox machine. It was never published in America. It just passed on from Xerox to Xerox to Xerox to Xerox. And my Xerox is so bad already, I cannot read only 70%. It's so bad. But the idea is there, and I believe that's the new frontier. My friends, I hope that uh, it stimulated some thoughts, and it certainly tired me out, because that room is a very difficult room to talk to. Anyway, I finished. Thank you very much.
if there are any questions, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Fabos would be happy to respond. This one back there, Julius? Yes, sir. Can you speak up? Can you come closer? Can you come closer, my friend? Yes, I did. Yes. Yes, most of us. Or most of you, I don't know who. 95% of people in that category, yes. Not too long. I, I would say, I would say that in five years, within five years, most architecture schools, most landscape architecture schools, uh, will require uh, simulation and uh, money, data manipulation, uh, decision making, use of the computer. Within five years, if you are not if you are not doing that extensively within five years, I would be very surprised. The landscape planning is already happening. You know. In landscape planning, I don't know any landscape planning program in the country uh, any good which is not based greatly on the use of the computers. It's impossible to do because, uh, because the complexity of the problem is so much that, uh, that without the machine you, you could not do the type of work what we, what, we, uh, what we do today. So what I'm basically saying that if you graduated now without the knowledge of the machine, you are outdated. I have to underline, and I have to urge everybody, you know, I want to urge administration to, to get a few good people and, and get on a computer. You know, that's, that's you know, this is, if you, if you fight it individually or collectively, uh, you have the same result as the people had to try to fight the railroads. They didn't go too far, did they? You know, that's a very powerful technology, and I think a very useful technology. I, I wanted to have two sides here that the computer age is an incredibly useful technology, one, and secondly, we can make our decision-making process much better by the use of the computer. Two simple messages. Any other questions? We're all screwed. Say again? We're all screwed. No more questions. Thank you again, my friends. Thank you very much. Might I remind everyone that if uh, anyone wants a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to chat with Dr. Fabos, that he'll be with the student group uh, for the next hour or so at uh, reception held at uh, Hasib Derhali's apartment. Uh, there are notices up around on the walls.